All right, uh, we're going to call this meeting of the Muskego Parks and Conservation Committee to order. Uh, this is our April meeting, obviously. First item is the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. When do you want to call the roll? Uh, Alderman Terrence. Toby Whipple. Here. Terry Boyer. Here. Matthew Bugman. Present. Barbara Erdman. Here. Bill Miller. Here. And Barbara Schrader. Here. Okay, this meeting uh, was posted in accordance with the open meeting laws. First item is, uh, or next item is approval of the minutes from the October meeting. Is there a motion to approve? Motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Bill? Any corrections or additions? This thing is not working. Everybody got a chance to look at them before the meeting? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Minutes are approved. New business, update on the parks and open space plan from uh, for 2017 through 2021, obviously the new plan would continue on from there. Tammy, you wanna go through this for us? Sure, so we've hit the point where we need to start working on the plan. It takes us about nine months to complete the surveys, the inputs um, from the public, us visiting all the park sites, input from you guys and then um, your approval and forwarding on to the council for approval. So the park and open space plan or park and conservation plan or park, it's had like four or five different names as many of you have been on, um, is something that we use for all of our planning for capital budgeting purposes, improvements we need to make to the park. It is used as part of the city's comp plan for development. So it is a, it's a vital piece of documentation that we use within house for all of our planning. So the, the timeline is listed of us, how we're working on things. We really hope that as we send you guys information, you're looking over it, providing feedback. Uh, you do know a little bit more about what the public is looking for than we do at times. So uh, if you can be part of that conversation, giving us information, it'll be very helpful for us to finish this project. And then in August, we'll send out a digital draft of what we've compiled so far for feedback. And then we'll have a formal plan um, that we'll present in October at our uh, park and conservation meeting at that point. Anybody have any questions? Will you send out a notice when uh, when you're going to have the meetings as we get into the more detailed stuff towards the end? Yeah, we right now we were just trying to get through a couple of big projects we had and getting our book done. So now I'll start. We'll have more regular meetings. We potentially might have an intern this summer, and this might be his major project too. So okay. that would be very helpful to have somebody that can spend a little more time out in the parks looking at stuff. So but I will include everybody in the email chain when we are having meetings. If people can attend, that would be wonderful. Okay, we, need, we don't need to take any other action on this tonight. No questions? We will move on. Manchester Park, Manchester Hill Park, ribbon cutting event. Tammy? So as you all know, Allie worked diligently for a year to raise quite a bit of money for the playground at um, the whole playground at Manchester Hill Park. The site has been completely removed of all of the existing playground pieces except for the dinosaur that we're keeping and the swing set that was relatively new. Um, they have brushed back trees, expanded the area, and so this week uh, the install is beginning to happen. So we would like to have a ribbon cutting event to honor the playground as well as the work that Allie has done. And so we're looking at doing it uh, Thursday, May 20th. We're shooting for a five o'clock time frame. She's also going to have a grand opening the next day. She's working on getting food trucks and 
a whole bunch of stuff to celebrate the accomplishment. So we're inviting all of the uh, Park and Conservation Committee, the aldermen will be invited as well to come and help us celebrate this pretty awesome so it's endeavor. gonna be a two-day event. It's a two-day air, yeah. She's also having a grad party that weekend too, I think. Oh, okay. She's just really gonna do it up good, so. Could be a three-day event. Yeah. So when we have all the final invitations done, we'll send stuff out. But I wanted to get it on your radar because it is getting close to the graduation, weddings, travel time. So everybody knew that it was coming up. Oh, wait, and there is a YouTube video. If you have not yet seen it, no. um, we, uh, Jake from our IT department came and flew the drone while they were taking down the existing pieces oh. and did a really cool little video. So... It is out there to watch and, and uh, see. She got to wear the golden hat and have the shovel and the whole deal. So it was kind of fun to, to watch her get to do those type of things. Any questions about this? She obviously did a really good job raising the funds. Good for her. Okay, parking at Marshland Camps Preserve. Is that Tom? This is Tom. So uh, this is the land dedication from Big Muskego Estates. It was a conservancy area that was, um, because of the density transfer and the development of Big Muskego Estates, uh, this was left um, in conservancy and Town Realty later uh, dedicated it over to the city. Since then, we've done a lot of work with the restoration of this land. It actually is the third largest conservation property that's owned by the city. Uh, it's 49 acres. Much of it along the the west is, uh, is a wetland area, but um, there's significant areas of upland as well. Um, it's near areas where people can, should be able to recreate and walk through it. There'd be, there'd be a really good path, um, to go from that area to Astor Hills Park or to Sand Hill Park it would, um, uh, it would get, get you a little closer to going directly to the park, uh, if there were a trail were to go through there. So this would be an area to safely pull off to the side and park a vehicle if you were to walk on that conservancy area. Um, that area used to be, Holtz Drive used to go straight east and there's roadbed material underneath where it's depicted in yellow. So it's already very compacted. You could, with very little work, um, create an area for a couple cars to park there. I think that's all I have, Scott. The only thing, and I worked with Tom about this, is so just to let everyone know, if there's a culvert pipe, we'll pull a culvert pipe from our DPW yards. We use asphalt millings. So asphalt millings, whenever we do our road program, we take off the road, and then we store a pile of asphalt millings, and it's probably one of the biggest piles in the back of DPW. We add asphalt millings to our trails, um, if you haven't seen it, and we also add it to the conservation area. So from a cost standpoint, we're using our own staff, we're recycling the material and we're using a culvert pipe. So it, it's not gonna add any cost. And I think John or Tom said like six spots, that's that's it, just to let you know. So I'm just telling you from a DPW thing, it's not gonna cost the city anything. We, we, we reuse this material and um, it's a nice way to reuse it and kind of be, I guess, environmentally sustainable by doing this, so. I'll make a motion to approve the construction of the small parking lot. Okay. We need discussion, please. Okay. Toby? Well, we will have discussion. We would need a motion first. We've got a motion on the floor, and is there a second to it? I'll second. We'll have discussion. I'll okay. second. Moved and seconded. Go ahead. Okay. Um, Big Muskego Estates is concerned about um, these uh, parking spaces because we are... Um, we are responsible for the pond that's there. That's our detention pond. And so if you start, people come in and park their vehicles there and we're liable. We hold uh, also insurance on that pond. 
and I believe that I have some other <laughs> people from um, our uh, subdivision that would like to speak. Is that okay, Toby? Sure. Any Anybody else on the board have anything? Uh, otherwise, we'll let people here that want to discuss it. Come on up to the microphone. Hello. There you go. You're all set. All right, should I state my name? Yes, please. Aaron Blazer, A-A-R-O-N-B-L-A-Z-E-R. -E uh, I'm on the current uh, Big Muskego Estates Board of, what do they, committee board. And um, so I have documents here. I can give them to you. I think Barb has them as well. So at the current time, I don't, I don't know if you guys are familiar with how e what I believe how easements work. So we have an easement on the property. And, okay, so we have an, e is that better? Okay, so we have an easement on the property. And in that easement, how I believe easements work is that, for example, if we had a well on the property and the city, which purchased it from townhomes, were to buy the property, you guys couldn't seal up the well because we have an easement. And there's an easement in the document, it states, in conjunction with the easement, out lot three, which is this entire property, and I'll just read verbatim what it says here, prohibited uses of the land, any activity or use of the property inconsistent with the purpose of the easement is prohibited without limiting the general of um, <clears throat> foregoing the following activities and uses are expressly prohibited, clear cutting or removal of trees, dredging or filling of wetlands, except as may be authorized um, basically, there's not, by putting a parking lot there, is there anything to do with, is that, I mean, it's not recreation. They're not supposed, there's no recreation allowed on this land. Since we have an easement on the property, if you put a parking lot, that increases our liability. And, you know, you put up a parking lot, less water is going to be drained, more, or more water will be drained into our, our pond. Uh, I, I mean, if we were to, give up the easement, then I, I don't see a problem here, but we have documentation that says that you can't really touch the land without going through us. At least that's what I see here in this document. Does that make sense? Scott, do you have any comments on this? I'll have to check with Jeff, but the easement is just around the pond. The conservation area is there, and that's dedicated to the city. So just to let everyone know, if someone pulls off on the road and walks that conservation area, they can. There's no rule of them stopping that person walking in it right now. Um, I, I, unless there's another different documentation that I know of, um, it doesn't say that anyone can't access that property. Now, there is signs already out there around the pond saying no trespassing around the pond, just to kind of let everyone know. Um, but that's all I know. I don't know. I've never heard a document saying that you can't access that conservation area. That is, I believe, the city's property. Yeah, I guess you can't access the pond. Without a doubt. No, without a doubt. We will okay. not access the easement of the pond, and that's why the signs were put up there. However, again, with the document, it doesn't say that you can just put a parking lot on the land because that impacts the easement. Would the parking lot be beyond the... Parking, yeah. the parking lot's not even on the easement. I, I know that it's on no. the easement, but it's on it's the outlet, which is part of the, the agreement. The out, it'd be like this. If, if I had a well on your property, I couldn't dump oil next to the well just because, well, that's not part of the well. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, I, I can look at that that document and we've gone over it. It just seems like if you want me to, I can have Jeff, the, the lawyer, look at that. So is a parking lot considered conservation? That's, I guess, another question. It would be an attended facility to conservation lands. We have them on Battersea Preserve. Engle Conservation areas have areas to park. Um, this is in an area also that is a partially in the road right of way that well, the old roadbed of Holtz Drive. So there, there's not any infiltration of water as presently in, in that area so that there wouldn't be a change really in, in the hydrology of the land. We recently 
did wetland restorations to increase the amount of water that that site holds. There, if there's four wetland scraped ponds that were created about four years ago. Mm -hmm. So that land now is, is holding much more storm water than historically had. All right, I'll, I'll just read one last thing here then. So in this document again, it says, for grantee or owners of any lands described in this flat, which is, it's describing outlot three, and big Muskego estates and their successors heirs and assignees to use said land for stormwater management purposes. This is not a storm water management purpose. So you're, I mean, it's a violation of the agreement that was signed by, I can't remember, James uh, Boris, I believe, James Boris Dorian. from from Big Muskego Estates. I mean, I, it's what the the rules say. If you guys don't agree with that, I mean, that's one thing, but it, that's what I'm reading. I think we need designation, or we need a map to show us exactly where your property is and where the city's property is, because it's, because people that are residents of the city should be able to go on to conservation land that's that's currently yeah. owned by the city, correct? I guess correct. Yes, you could go on the land, but that doesn't necessarily mean you can put a lot. parking lot on the land. But so should they park on the street? Because then that causes all kinds of problems with parking on the street. I'm. I guess what I would suggest is that we come to agreement and remove the easement. If we remove the easement, then I'm not here. How are you but using, excuse me, how are you using the easement now? Do you have to go to that pond yeah, to do we are, something? We actually were required by the city, that was it uh, last year? Yes. To repair stuff. So we had to repair. Okay, but my understanding of easements is because you have something that is behind another property, you are given the right to go through that property to get to what's yours. But I don't think you really have any jurisdiction over that property. You just have a right of way to go to your things. No, but but you, I don't think what you have we're required the land. Okay, so when someone signed the agreement that said, hey, this is the land, Big Miss, uh, by the way, Town Homes was not allowed to do anything to the property. Would you, when this, if this was 15 years ago and they wanted to put up a parking lot so they could park some construction equipment there, would the city be like, oh, like go ahead and do that? I don't think you guys would. But now that you own it, you want to do what you want with it, but you're forgetting that we also have an agreement and this impacts our agreement. I guess the attorneys will have to look into the agreement no, because it. It, isn't that's this mostly in the road easement anyway? I, I can no. have Jeff look at the agreement and go through this and not it's not a problem if just put it on hold. I'll have Jeff go through the agreement. But I'm assuming it's when we get through it to it, there's a couple things. There's the easement just for the pond, but there's the agreement of the land. Right. I think we're talking two different things. I will let yes. Jeff, yeah. the lawyer, go through it. We'll have a big map to show everyone to kind of talk about it. It just, I'll get it all right so that when we come here, I'll even if worst case scenario, Jeff will attend one of these meetings and he will provide guidance to you guys and how to, how to vote. That's not a problem at all. But what clearly it is, the agreement is, there's a conservation area and then there's, an e, there's a pond in that conservation area and there's an easement that's been given the big Muskego Estates to maintain and use that in land as their pond for their stormwater detention. So that's just said in a nutshell. Correct. Yeah. I, so there's two. There are two things. There's a conservation easement that was signed way back in 2000, which that's where the density transfer for the development was done, so that that could not be built upon, and it was to be preserved in in an open space uh, uses. Um, so that's different than the easement that would access the pond, as, as Scott was talking about. So there's two things here we got to. Yeah, I'm aware. Do. I don't have the document for the conservation easement, but it is referenced in here. No problem deferring this. I mean, time-wise. So one one other thing I would like to just kind of get on record, though. There's this is not uncommon. We have two other situations right. where there are stormwater retention ponds on city land. Bloom Park and Moreland Park, the skateboard park, have two rather 
significant areas of, of ponds that are that are on public lands, um, and there is a lot of other waterways, obviously on city-owned conservation and parkland, which um, is really you know hasn't been a liability issue to have ponds. There's a pond at Manchester Hill Park. Um, there's a pond at Park Arthur. Um, all of these places have have what you know ponds in them. So. Yeah, well, you're concerned about about a liability that I don't know if it's. The, I mean, I, how realistic that situation is. Um, so, just because of the, the, all the other waterways that we have in the city, I can't think of an instance where we've had you know. Well, it's some claim land, or right? whatnot. It's you know, I mean, land. pardon. I mean, it's part of our conservancy. It's public land. It's public land, for sure. Right. If, if you guys defer this, yeah. this is not going to hold up any construction. I'm, okay. I'm just letting you know. I We can do this whenever. We can hold off. So if you want, just defer it. I'll talk to Jeff. No need to go into it too much. Again, there's no rush. I, I, I We are not beating down the doors to, to go do this anytime. And I can do it at any time, just to let you know. So, But I'd like to, I mean, I guess point out, just like one of the other board members mentioned, is that, I mean, I'm, I believe our board would be fine with giving up the easement. You just let us sign the paperwork probably. So, so then you can do whatever you want. Just to let you know, and the board knows, the city of Muskego will not take over this pond. Right. It has been told to them, we don't plan on taking over ponds. If we do, we set a precedent and I will have 50 HOAs at the doorstep knocking on our door to take over the ponds. We don't take over ponds. We just don't. We make them even more stricter than probably what it was with the agreement with them nowadays of maintenance by the HOA. Just to let everyone know and be clear that we have had this discussion probably over a year ago, maybe two years ago, the city of Muskego has no intention of ever taking over this pond. And, and just to be yeah. everyone aware, mm -hmm. I just want everyone to be aware of that. How so. many conservancies does the have you know are have ponds in them that are like this situation? Moreland Park, Moreland Park, Bloom Park. So where, um, where another estate has a, a pond that they drain into that's that's owned by the city. Bloom Park is owned by the city. The pond for Bloom Park is Bell Chase Three. That's the difference. Quiet. But Quiet. it's the same thing. You said we, you, we own the land and your pond drains into that. Yeah. So that's what Bloom Park is there. And Moreland Park, the pond there, that's... Quiet, what do you believe? I believe it's a public, it's a private subdivision that has their pond on the public land. I'm just providing two examples. I'm happy to talk to Jeff. We'll go through all the agreements. We'll have a report for you next time. So, Bill, are you fine deferring this? I'm fine deferring it. I, I, I think that I don't know the difference between what it is standing right now and what it's going to be because someone can walk off of that street, right off of Holtz Drive, walk up to that pond, and once they breach that trespassing thing, they're perfectly legal in being there. But once they breach that tr no trespassing sign, now they're trespassing. So they're breaking the law, right? So, but they can do that right now. Putting a parking lot there is not going to change that. It's not gonna change what the law already has in place. It's just gonna give people access to park and do it because it's there and, and they should be able to enjoy the cons conservation land that's owned by the city. So that I'm might... fine with deferring this, but I, I just think that you're looking at it 
I understand where you're coming from because you're looking at the liability, but the liability is covered by no trespassing signs. They're well, trespassing. It's actually two things, it's not just liability, it's pond drainage as well. well. What, but putting in crushed gravel mm -hmm. or, or uh, asphalt millings is, it's, it's not permeable. Change that. It's not gonna change anything. It's like adding some dirt there. So, I mean, it's probably better. I, that's just my opinion, I, and I'm fine deferring it. Yes, but why don't we do that? Okay. Who is the second? Terry, did you second yeah, or exactly. are you okay with deferring yeah, it? Absolutely. All right. Okay. All right, we'll defer that until the next meeting, or until we have more information from the attorney. Okay, this one, lake access hours of operation. So during our public works and safety meeting, uh, an issue about no parking came up. And during this whole process, we found out that we have no lake access hours of operation. Um, so what we're looking to do and propose, and remember this both has to get, once you guys are okay with it, then it will go to common council to get their full kind of sign a jaw off on it too is because that means then the police can write a ticket for this is we want to have lake access points the same as parks so 5 a.m to 10 p.m now again some lake access points act as boat launches boat launches are separate just even though it says in there it describes that any lake access may be declared close to the public by director but also it says except for the purpose of using the boat launch to launch or remove a watercraft the language that I provided there, and again, it'll be checked by Jeff, is pretty much taken from the parks hours. I just changed it from parks to lake access, just to let everyone know. But we have nothing. And some of these lake accesses are right next to private residencies. So it would only make sense to kind of treat these just as parks. I guess I always assumed that the hours for the parks applied to them. Most people have, but... Some don't. We we don't have any. <laughs> I, I'm being honest. We don't have any of these yeah. lake access points, and we have no signs up there, and that's why we kind of consider them just like parks. So. That's why. It's an enforcement issue for the right. police. So if somebody, yeah. some kids are there having a party, and the neighbors call the police, they can't do anything because there is nothing in our code nor published saying that it's 10 o'clock, you guys have to go. And so it's just putting something that will allow the police to actually enforce the regulations of that use. So we've had problems? Yes. Okay. Such, we've had, more, we've, such as? We've had, um, well, the current issue that brought this up was people accessing the lake at very random times. In the past, we've had people snowmobiling coming off on and off the lake later than they should, um, going to their ice shanties when they shouldn't. So they're parking in front of residences at five in the morning or earlier than five and going onto the water, uh, especially when the ice is frozen. I, I think one of the things is with COVID, people have been trying to use more outdoor activities and we also at DPW have cleaned up the lake access points quite well. There's better signs, we're trying to clean it up. So more public people have been taking advantage of these lake access points. But then there was just a couple issues and we realized we never had hours of operation for them. So what we're trying to do is just consider it just like a park, treat it just like a park. And this will allow the police to have some type of enforcement. So, so this is going to be throughout the entire season on both lakes? It, it's, any, lakes. it's anywhere a lake access point is. So for example, I, I'm a duck hunter. If mm -hmm. I want to go hunting and I want to get out there before the day opens, which typically is, you know, you'll get out there at 3.30. Um, I can't do that legally now. You can go through the boat launch. Oh, boat, okay, launch, the boat, boat, launch. boat launches, again, that's why it says, I, uh, I for the purposes of using boat launch to launch or remove watercraft. So the, the thing is this, why those boat launches are there, and we say that even in the parks, is because most duck hunters do get there and Gross. probably get out there before 5 a.m. on the boat launch to get your boat out there. Okay. Mm -hmm. What type of enforcement would it be? Like what, what type of citation? Uh, I can't remember the exact wording, but basically it's violating the park hours. So it's, 
I think the biggest thing for the police is having a leg to stand on to say, hey, you got to go. And if you don't go, when we come back in an hour, we're going to give you a ticket. And the citation is probably like in the $125 to $150 range um, for being in parks. And they're very good in all of our parks. They drive through and if they see people there after hours, hey, you need to go. Um, we've had... We've had people throw weddings on the lake access points next to their homes without requesting it. They've put up tents, they've had bands, they've served alcohol because they just assume it's just an open piece of land. We've had people erect tents to go camping on a weekend because it's a cool little green spot. But So it's just really giving the police an ability to say, hey, this doesn't meet the park requirements and there are other places you could go. So. They can still be there from five in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. They just can't be sitting out there. We've had people bring in fire pits and do fires by the shore. But if they want to go midnight kayaking, moonlight kayaking or anything, they can still use the three lake X or the three boat launches um, as well as Idle Isle to get on the water. So they still have access to the water and can use the water. It's just not the lake access is next to homes. Any other comments from the board? Otherwise, I'll entertain a motion to uh, approve this and move it on. John. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Just a side comment. Somebody had asked me one time about uh, ordinance on those locations for um, uh, walking dogs. <laughs> Uh, oh. If you're making signage, you might want to consider that as a point to consider, too, while you're busy. Like I say, I always considered them a park. I, and then and the I'm looking same at rules applied. I'm looking at the code. Um, there's definitions of a park. So park hours apply to parks. A park, parkway, recreation facility, playground, beach, or open space area owned or used by the city devoted to passive or active leisure time activities. So we're, we're probably already covered, but it sounds like they just want something a little more definitive, right? Is that? I, yes, there's two codes that kind of cover this area. So besides once council approves, we would have to adjust to municipal code to include just lake access point would be one for part of the code and then there's another area on lake access points and we would just put in that language i had in there for hours but we would have to, this would be an adjustment to our municipal code but first we need to start with you right just asking for hours of operation we're trying to do we, we just didn't have anything written down and it's come to our attention that we need to have something so the way it's written on here is a little confusing. That's why I was confused about the the bolt launch thing. It's like, boy, you're going to upset a, a lot of people. Come <laughs> yeah, <down. laughs> that's why I did put on there, except for the purpose of using the bolt launch to launch and remove a watercraft. That's exactly the same language that's in the hours in, for parks. Yeah, okay. and, and that's why I took it from there. I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Sure, I just sure, kind sure. of changed no, instead just, of parks, lakes, access. So, but yeah, it is. I mean, that's how municipal codes are written. Lawyer talk. So, Bill, you want to make a motion to pass this on to council? Sure, I'll make a motion. I think is there, it's, is there a second? I'll second. It's been moved and seconded. Any other discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, uh, Scott, update on the capital yep. projects. I always like to give you guys an update on capital projects, what, what's going on, what has gone on, um, and what's coming up, because it's always important because we're, I know it's April, but already starting tomorrow, I have my first run of capital with pretty much um, all the staff here on, on just getting things and ideas. So just to kind of give you an idea on certain things, for example, um, starting off, um, Tammy made it the point alley. She raised her goal for Manchester Park. We had money in that. That's that work started this week or, or getting going. All the safety improvements for the baseball fields, they're going to be completed in April 2021. 
The fields then are usually released around mid-April with first game scheduled at the end of April. So baseball season is here, just everyone to get, get going. Um, one other thing too, is the permanent park bathrooms will be open at the beginning of May. The bathrooms got all new epoxy floors, LED lights, um, electric hand dryer replacements. So we have no more paper product in there, which is great because they tend to take that stuff and stuff it down toilets and be a problem. So that should help. All our park cameras from last year are up and running, which is good. Um, we've already caught uh, at Park Arthur, we've caught some vandalism already. Um, working with the police station or the police and also we're in the process ready the planning process for 2021 as well for all those cameras now the last thing to do and why it's more relevant is the plan is to fix park arthur fields one two and three so we had a cow meeting probably about a month ago tammy myself and ryan and we proposed there if you're going to do this the right way we proposed and it was agreed upon to move forward is to turf the infields of these three places. So now you're talking turf fields for infields only and the strips along the, the sidelines. One reason why too is field prep. Field prep has always been a big cost, costs a lot of money. There's no field prep when there's turf fields. These fields also will be used pretty much from April to October. And this will probably be a stunning facility that will be used by a lot of teams that are very kind of interested in using baseball fields because they'll all be always be ready. Tournaments, we already have what? How many tournaments for the year? We have six tournaments already signed up for the year. This probably will make tournaments every year by doing the turf. Um, that right now is out to bid. The plan is for the public bids to be opened up on Thursday of this week. And then I would take that to council for their approval on later in April, which I believe is April 27th for that meeting. So those three fields, they will fix the drainage and they will turf those fields. Now, when you do that, I wanna let you know, basically take those fields, take all the fencing down, regrade it, put a drain system in, put turf and put brand new, brand new um, fencing up. Right now, the fields are bad, they don't drain. This is the one solution. And after talking and presenting to the cow, moving forward with the idea of turf, which is what you're seeing more and more. You've seen it at the high school for football games. It is just the way that everything is trending with our unpredictable weather out here. So. Are you talking about turfing the entire field? Nope, not the outfields. Just the infields. Just the infields and a strip, like a five foot strip so that the, you know, that white painted line is permanent. Right. Never have to field prep it. This also, field prep is a big thing. This is one way that we can control our field prep and charge the rental fees for much lower for uh, local programs like the Storm Warriors um, that MAA here, so. How long in field prep is that gonna take to recoup the cost? Excuse me. I think we... So we, we have we pulled a few numbers uh, without going into too much detail until we saw what the bid packages were coming in. We brought it to council. Um, what we could, currently the cost to prep a field for the teams in Muskego is $175. And then if they use lights, they have additional fees. So the plan that we kind of proposed was keeping the fee low for the local teams, under $100 for their prep and use, including lights and then having a much higher fee for tournament use and outside teams. Um, and I think the consensus from the council was not so much on recouping those fees, it was providing a really good service for the teams that are based in Muskego because they would have priority use. And there are a lot of teams that play here. So probably 400 and some games of just Muskego based teams that use the fields right now. And just to let you know, current field prep is 175 bucks. So, and it is not going down every year. It's every, we have a two year contract every year. It, it, it's tend to be last year was one or two years ago was 165. It's creeping up. So this is one of the ways to do it. The field usually lasts eight to 12 years. 
um, our cost in just looking at the numbers, we figured out a way of how do we replace these fields. So we have it all in the cost of, of redoing that. Um, and then we throw in the capital how much you need the rubber pellets in maintaining it. Um, but again, that would be the, the game plan of having these fields. This year alone, the Muskego Storm only has one team playing in Muskego because of the cost of field prep. They've elected to take uh -oh. five other age grouped teams into Waukesha to pay because paying the rate there is cheaper than playing home field games. So it, it we will be able to charge for practices. We will be able for outside teams. We will be able to allow our teams first priority and let them use it, but then still be able to handle the excess use we would get from outside users. So like the rock has already kind of reached out to us. If they had a really big tournament, would they be able to rent fields to take even more teams in their program? So the, the way it would be set up is Muskego teams are always priority one. They will get on those fields when they want to. And then we will have all the extra time that we can um, rent out and make revenue to put back into replacing the turf within a 10 year time frame. Okay. This doesn't include the big field there? No. What, what's the status on that one? It's play as is. So the council approved last year not fixing that fields because of the cost and then lighting one of the high school fields instead. So the teams are playing games there on the high school field, which the prep costs are less. So the city paid for the lights and the school district matched with some additional funds to yeah. light another field because what you did to a boys field, you have to do to a girls field. So then they have lights on those fields and are able to play the high, you know, the 14 and up games on the high school fields. So the MAA is still using that field. So what happens when they can't use that field? Well, they, they only play there one day a week. So if they can't get it in there, then they move it over to Horn and they'll okay. play at Horn. So they only have five teams, I think it is, in four, the high school four. level. Four. Yeah. So. That's pretty typical. Yeah. And I think the goal that we heard from them was they wanted to get those kids on the high school fields as soon as they could. So they would be able to move their games over there and it, it's actually cheaper. The prep costs and the use, they have no used costs and their preps 125, I think on the weekends for school district facilities. So then that field just sits? For now. On tournaments, but it's not like we don't use a field. It's just that if it rains, you can't really use right. the field. But is it bad field? No, we still prep the field and, and everything just to let everyone know, you know, yeah. just. My son's played on it for the yeah. last several years, so. Yeah. It, it does have severe drain issues. And there are things that I think Ryan has said he's gonna try and figure out if we can avert water from the sled hill a little bit better. Um, but that, when we've had the discussions with turfing those fields and looking at making this a premier baseball facility in the future, we would want to have a hardball field plus the three smaller fields mm -hmm. so that you could have tournaments that would do U8 through 18 yeah. in reality. Mm -hmm. Also, just schedule-wise, and this is really tight, July 19th, we would start by like, I think we gave whoever the contractor and the scope you got to have it done by like first, second week in September because we got to grow grass. The outfield is still going to be grass. It's just going to be an underdrain system. If you did all of the outfield, it gets really hot, I heard. Uh, so it was not recommended in that case. But we, the goal plan, the game, and the biggest goal here is by spring of 2022, those fields it come around April, we're ready to go. So this is, we've been working with all the baseball teams. We know, we told them, hey, this is the last day for the games. All the games have been moved off to other fields and then that work was gonna start. So, and that's, that's pretty much, the, that's probably the biggest project you're gonna see in the parks this year is by far that one. Um, you'll see a nice little improvements with the epoxy floors, the cleanups. Um, I think a lot of nice touches out there and we, we predict it to be a heavy, heavy use parks, just like we did last year. Again, so. Any questions or comments? Okay, next thing. If you scroll down to 2022, I just like to kind of give some updates of what we got going on. And again, this is my time for you 
to give me feedback, to reach out to me. We have time, okay? This is just what we had on our schedule last year for 2022. All the baseball field, rugby, rugby, soccer fields, the first things, that's yearly cost. We do that every year. That's for us to get the field safe for everyone to use. So pretty much that cost is, is, the same, is not gonna change and it's always needed. But for the parks, tennis court, pickleball courts, the two outdoor seating with the, with the shade areas, those are new areas that we're, we're planning to do for 2022. Um, the dumpster enclosure, the 10,000, 10,000, 5,000, those are ones that we plan on doing, again, for 2022. Playground sets, those three items, we spend that all the time. It's, it's just our maintenance stuff for it. And then all the parking, uh, the park structure and lots, so the last thing that we need to do for these bathrooms is, if you've ever gone to a new bathroom now, it's kind of like the epoxy, the plastic inside. We have the old metal ones that we paint and they just need to go. So for 2022, pretty much every indoor thing for the parks, we would rip out all the, the um, stalls and replace them with that nice epoxy stuff. You don't have to paint, it weathers, everything does pretty good. Um, but that is what we have for 2022. If you go back and look at some of the other capitals, 2023, the big one in that one will be replacing veterans. Um, that playground set all needs to be redone. But give me ideas. Tell me stuff. You know, even if it's not for 2022, we do five years out. We, we, that's how we have to plan and that's how we have to present to the council. They want to see five years out what we got planned. And then they also help us too, like, hey, can you move this up? Can you slide this stuff back to kind of have a more balanced um, budget for each year? But if you guys hear things, let me know. I mean, this is, this is your time to, you know, again, that parks and open space plan, if you go through that, we always use that. That's what drives us for capital. Why it also needs to be updated is because a lot of stuff that was requested, we actually did. Uh, Tammy and I, when we were going through it, we, we've done a pretty good job of, of doing that. Um, I think too, some of you guys were able to, to do our parks tour last year. Yeah, that's, that's happening again. Um, the other thing too is, I know you guys saw the beer garden and stuff like that and everything, that's coming again. Just to let you know, we had a very successful winter one that was at Park Arthur a couple of years, or a couple months ago. Um, they did a very good job on the one day out there for the whole sledding thing. Um, I don't know if that's going to be common or all the time, but um, our parks guys, DBW, they created cross country ski trails. We have the sledding out there. It was, it was turned out to be a very fun event, um, something more for, for the winter. So we're looking for ideas. Um, again, our guys are creative. We love doing things, but if you tell us some things, we'll, we, we'll put it in the, uh, in the plan and capital. And it, but I love getting five years out. Even if you think it's, kind of out there, let me know. If you guys are at a different park, let us know. We're, we're always looking for ideas. Did, somebody had talked about Lake de Noon and the benches, and I know we had a problem with benches being stolen, right? Did we figure out a way to... We got cameras going up there. Drill them down 50 feet. We, 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 we actually have concrete pads and we have special locks on them to kind of do it. So if you are, you are taking some time to rip these things up. Now, we do have proposed cameras going out there this year. We've already been out there. Um, we already got our locations going. That's why we're cameraing them. Guys, we, we had some vandalism at Park Arthur. It didn't take long for us. I try to stress to everyone, you're on camera. And if you think you're not, nope, you, will, you are on camera. And we have done pretty good working with police and with the police at the schools, and it doesn't take us long to catch individuals. But I am telling people, you are on camera at our parks, and it's becoming more and more, just to let you know. So are there benches out there now? Yeah. Oh. Yeah, we replace them. Okay. Um, we, and our DPW guys are, are doing a pretty good job. If, if we'll, we'll find out another way to kind of tighten them down even more. But okay. I, the stopping of the vandalism, cameras seem to work pretty good because... The cameras are really clear. The video is pretty clear. And um, ten people tend to post their things on social media of what they've done, which is probably not the smartest thing in the world, but that's fine. Go ahead, keep continuing to do it. But um, yeah. All right, awesome. 
Thanks, Scott. Any other comments? Hearing none, uh, next is director's report, recreation manager, Tammy. Would you like to say something? I've been so wrapped up in doing our summer program guide that my brain, I don't even remember what I wrote four days ago. So, um, so we are, we have been full scale even during COVID. We ran all of our programs last summer, just really worked hard on putting safe practices in. We've been up and going this whole school year. Our plan is to proceed full scale again with the summer. So, um, but we did not publish a, did, or a, a guide that was mailed out because we made so many changes if we had to change locations or we added additional classes to break up sizes. So we're actually doing two guides this summer. We are doing one that will be online that's a full guide that people will be able to look at and click on and go right to our registration site. And then we're mailing an abridged guide that will have all of our classes, but just basically like the titles and the dates and times of them directing people back. So um, the goal is today we put all of our classes online so people can see what we're offering. By uh, Friday, we'll have the online guide and the digital guide or the printed guide will go to the post office, hopefully the beginning of next week. And then we start registration next Wednesday. So um, We've really, Adam has added quite a bit of outdoor adventure type things. We have have been doing a big Muskego kayak with Tom and a Fox River. Uh, Tom's got some conservation things that we've got going on. So um, we've added a candlelight hike. We're trying to get a lot more of just the outdoor natural things for adults to do um, because we didn't have a very high enrollment for adults in this last session. I think they're working, they, just wanted to get their kids into things. So we're trying to find some more things to get adult, adults involved in. Um, and we're in the process of getting the Idle Isle concession area ready. DPW crews are there this week. They're painting the area that had been the, I, the island ice cream shop um, and getting that area ready. We will be hiring a couple staff people to work there. They will be able to rent our kayaks or stand up paddle boards. We're gonna be purchasing some um, like the, the large lawn games, like the Jenga and things like that. So we'd be able to rent those out. We'll have minimal concessions, prepackaged things like chips, water, soda. And then um, we'll be able to sell our boat launch passes and the parking passes. And then they will be the people helping with our park rentals of the three rental sites that we have there. Um, as Scott mentioned, baseball with the last week, baseball has been just itching to get on every field, but we're still finishing up hmm. preseason work. Soccer starting practice this week. Um, I've been trying to get a hold of rugby, but I haven't heard anything from them. So I don't know if their season's still on hold just because of the intense contact in that particular sport with COVID. Um, but baseball is, is full bore. They're all ready to go. Um, we have the six tournaments, um, some Muskego teams have added tournaments and some outside teams have approached us for tournaments, which has been good. Uh, we have the um, four beer garden dates that are set that the city is hosting with component. They're listed on there. And then we also have been approached by the um, storm to do the, a beer garden. And then the Lions Club has is interested in possibly doing one. So. The, all, all at Veterans? All at Veterans Park. Okay. Um, so, uh, I, I, you know, our park use is not diminishing at all. We are getting, every day we get at least two or three park rentals. Most of them are from non-residents because there still is not a lot open in Milwaukee County. So if they need a graduation party or something for their kids, they're heading out here. So our parks will be super busy. Um, mm -hmm. And then, as I mentioned, we got a lot of fun outdoor classes. I wanted to make sure if you haven't been out on the lake with Tom and Adam on a kayak trip, you really should go. Really, really should go. They have a lot of fun. So they're listed on the bottom. They're also on the back page of the city newsletter. You can just call us and register. And that's it. Are you guys selling ice at the at Idle Isle? Or would you, could you? Is that a good thing, bad it, thing? It's some, we're trying to figure out how much money we have to spend on refrigeration and cooling. Um, so if we have... If we just buy a household refrigerator, we can keep a little bit of ice. The big concern is we're not, the people who are gonna work there are probably gonna be high school and college age kids. So it's gonna be me and Adam running and buying supplies all the time. And if 
we have days like we did last summer where when you looked at the camera, there were 150 people there underneath the shelter and they're running through product and we're constantly running to Costco to buy more chips and whatever. So we'll, we'll probably start real small and just keep adding things. Um, the mayor's talked to me a little bit too about uh, working with some of the local providers. So getting pops, maybe to do popcorn one month or sweet kettle delight or um, gingerbread house doing cookies. So we would add a local item that we would also sell that they would drop off and we would just, you know, pay them ahead of time and then make profit from it. So just trying to get the book done, which before I came in, I clicked the last save, I think, and then we just move on to the next thing. So, you know, I saw an ice vending machine somewhere. I don't know where I was. I don't think it was in Wisconsin, but you put your credit card in and out popped a five or 10 pound bag of ice or whatever they were selling. I have seen those. Yeah. So and maybe that would be something we'd be able to do yeah. if it, we maybe. have a contract with them and they yeah. just. Like Mr. Ice or mm -hmm. one of those companies. There, I've seen quite a few of them in Superior actually. Kind of by I, wearing the I, I think there's a lot of boaters that are looking for that. For sure. Right. They would definitely use it. Right. Well, and that's the, you know, we have, a smaller room, we're going to be using the bigger room. The water bugs are not doing concessions out of there. We're working with them to allow them to use that space. We're not going to sell anything on Wednesdays when their things are going on. But the small room, we don't have a whole lot of room to put other things in on top of. All the life jackets are in there. We're going to have some fishing equipment we're going to rent out of there. So we're trying to figure out how much is the little operation we can do. And we may have to look at other options for getting those items in. Because we've had people ask us about bait, too. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. One other thing, just I forgot to mention is probably saw a lot of park trees come down this year. Uh, we've taken another 400 down of ash trees. It, it just, guys, it's happening. Um, I think the last three years we've taken 400 down. Um, I did get a grant with MSD Green Infrastructure. We are going to put try to put some more trees back into the park with it. But I'm letting you know, it, it's just devastating. Um, these ash trees, and, and they're everywhere. <laughs> I mean, just everywhere. So in, in case people have said, hey, what's going on with trees, it, we, we've, we have to take them down. It, it's just a safety ha hazard. Um, we have no choice. But we are working to try to replace these as fast as we can, just to let everyone know. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Mm -hmm. Somebody asked me what when the old town hall is going to get painted. <laughs> I didn't have an answer. Do you have one? What? I didn't hear. It. So they were old town hall painting, oh. which was supposed to take place last year. They were supposed to have been there the end of last week when it was nice to finish the scraping and painting is supposed to be starting this week, weather dependent. So it, it is on the radar and Ryan's been working with them pretty extensively to get the job done. I don't know why the individual really cares about it, but <laughs> it looks horrible. And you know, we have, well, we took paint? two weeks off again in classes to try and have it done during that time and they weren't able to get it done. So now we have little kids going in there and they're, you know, having to work around that. So, but it will be done hopefully by the end of April if we don't have a ton of rain. Okay, thank you. Tom, conservation coordinator's report. Is this on? Okay. Um, yeah, I wrote it all down for your reading pleasure, so I don't, I don't really rehash the whole thing, but um, doing a lot of prescribed burning. We've had a pretty good year so far. Um, couple more things we'd like to get to, but uh, we, the major ones, um, Battisher Preserve in the Oak Savannah area there, Blattner Preserve, um, and Bloom Park, quite a really a large area. All those um, oak dominated plant communities are fire adapted. So it's really important to get fire through there once in a while. And we haven't, we haven't burned Bloom Park, I think in six years, seven years. So in the, in the oak woods there, so should have a good effect. Um, the other big thing, capital budget item is to replace the fence at Luther Parker Cemetery. That uh, cedar fence was put in at about 2000 and it's the posts are rotting out. Um, and we did get a contractor 
hired to put in a steel fence that's going to look like a wrought iron fence with um, these uh, triad finials on the on the uh, pickets, on, so it'll actually look really ornate, uh, appropriate for a 1840s site. Um, then the, we had a lot of birds that we observed in the kayak trips on Big Muskego Lakes and uh, on Big Big Muskego Lake. We put some cameras out on the Osprey platforms, put a, a camera out on what was to be the eagle nest, but they moved to a tree. Um, How smart! <laughs> so they didn't want camera shy or something. Um, <laughs> but we have two other nests that that have nesting um, ospreys on them now. And I sent around some pictures of those, the first eggs that were laid. So um, I think that's pretty much it. Any questions? Anybody have any questions for Tom? No. I guess not. Thank, Thank you. you. Any uh, miscellaneous communications? Anyone? No two turns. How about a motion to adjourn? Second. Bill moves we adjourn. Second. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? We're adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>